Our thoughts this morning are entitled, Precious is the Death of His Saints. And we find this uh, in Psalm 116, verse 15, where we read, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. You know, the question that comes up right off hand is, in what sense is death precious to God? Is it, when we look at the, the word of this, or the meaning of this Hebrew word, it means highly valued. So we could revise the question to say, in what sense is death highly valued to God? You know, on the surface, we might think that may, maybe God somehow takes joy in the death penalty. Well, I think when we examine the scriptures, we realize this is not the case. You know, Jesus himself in John eleven fifteen, we have recorded, Jesus wept. Then he said, then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. And this is, of course, the example of Lazarus and his death. And we know that our Lord loved him deeply to the point that he, he wept at his death. So we don't think that God greatly rejoices in the death penalty, but sees the necessity of it. Well, in what other sense is death valuable to God? We read in Psalm 116, now we're reading 12 through 15, and so this is the entire context of our scripture for today. What shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits for, toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of his people. And, you know, we commonly read this as part of our vow unto the Lord. And we usually stop right there. But the very next verse is, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So we have this additional context of this scripture of paying our vows unto the Lord in the presence of his people. And so we think the payment of these vows, which the Lord sees as supremely important, is another important part of this. It's, a, it's an indication of our dedication and our consecration and our love of the Lord to pay our vows. You know, if we look in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 7, 8, and we're going to read it according to the New Living Translation, it reads, These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. And we'll stop right there. I mean, one of the examples of, of wealth and value in our world is gold. And the Lord is saying here that these tests and trials of our faith are far more precious than anything on earth. And so it's really showing the proving of our faith. You know, it's one thing to say you have faith, but when you go through difficult trials and experiences, that's when we really prove it. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where we, we demonstrate in a very tangible way our faith. And the Lord is saying here that this is more precious than gold. You know, when we look at the trial of the dying process, there are several different ways we could look at this. Uh, from a spiritual standpoint, we all understand the necessity of death, the necessity of sin and death in God's plan. And spiritually, in our minds, we discern the, uh, the lo love, justice, power, and all the different aspects of this. And so spiritually, we understand it pretty easily, the dying process. Intellectually, within our own minds, we have a little more difficulty. So with spiritual eyesight, it's easy to see why there's a necessity. Intellectually, as we start to think about our own death, it increases the difficulty. 
And then emotionally, death is very difficult for all humans. You know, our, our scripture from, from John demonstrated that with regard to even Jesus and Lazarus. It, it was an emotional parting. He wept. And then finally, our own physical death, the deterioration of our own bodies is perhaps the most difficult trial of this dying process. So you see, we've got the full spectrum here from spiritual, intellectual, emotional, and physical. But by far the most difficult is to see our flesh deteriorate and to observe our capabilities decline. But the death of our flesh is really the proving of our faith. So intellectually, we understand the dying process. Spiritually, we see the necessity of it. Emotionally, it still wrenches at us. And when we see our own physical infirmities, well, that's really where we prove our faith. In James chapter 1, verse 12, we read, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who loved him. Once again, showing perseverance and proving of faith. And so really what we're talking about here is the death of the flesh, the necessity of the death of the flesh. This is a difficult part of our life experience. So how is death, the death of our flesh valuable to God? Well, we realize that there was a death penalty put on in Genesis, the day that thou eatest of, thou shalt surely die. And mankind since that time has been experiencing this promise from God. And in a sense, from the day that we are born, we start the dying process all the way to the grave. Some die young, many die very old. But for as an Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And that's the wonderful promise that we all really hold in reserve. And it's the foundation of our faith, isn't it? So life is really a slow dying process. You know, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31 says, I die daily. And in a sense, we are dying very slowly every day. Uh, I think in the context of this verse, however, he's talking about laying down one's life for the brethren, dying daily. So dying is a life-diminishing process. You know, in James chapter 4, verses, verse 14, according to the New Living Translation, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. You know, as we age and as we mature, we realize that, yeah, the life process does go very quickly. And when we're young, time seems to take forever for anything to uh, proceed, doesn't it? I mean, it seems like we've got all the time in the world. And yet, as we mature and grow and age, we realize, just like this scripture says, that it's like a fog. It's here. And then it just disappears all too fast. You know, part of this is, I think, our life perception. So when we're young, we don't have a lot of time experience. And so everything seems to take very long. And then as we age, things accelerate and occur very quickly. You know, I remember this in reference to um, our getting married and having kids and, you know, the the first few years of those children seemed to really take a long time. They were wonderful experiences, but time didn't seem to fly. And then since we've had grandkids, we, we see them growing up ever so quickly. And so just like the fog, it's here a little while and then it's gone. So 
Dying is a process, and it's a necessary process that the Lord allows us to experience. We're going to look at some of the reasons why. One of the things that we must do in all of our consecrations is to put aside self and to put the Lord first. And in John chapter 3, verse 30, we read, he must increase, but we must decrease. And that's a very wonderful way of putting it. So as we grow spiritually, as we grow emotionally, as we grow intellectually, we realize that we must decrease our own will and increase the Lord's. And, you know, this goes just beyond intellect because we realize as we age that our mental faculties, our physical faculties, our energy all starts to decrease. And all of us resist this to the extent that we can, but we realize the only natural consequence is that we must rely on the Lord. And so we see the dynamics of this very beautiful scripture. The Lord must increase, but I must decrease. And so as we see these things happening, an evidence of our faith is that we just trust in him. And you know, amongst our older brethren, we've seen quite a few that have been wonderful examples of this scripture in indeed. As we've been studying in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the wonderful chapter on the resurrection, it says, it is sown a natural body, is raised a spiritual body, describing the transition that the church must go through. Skipping down to verse 50, we read, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Another way of saying this is none of us are getting out of here alive. And so that's a given. However, what's promised is a spiritual body. And I don't think we can hardly comprehend the wonder and the power of a spiritual body, let alone an immortal spiritual body. And so God's saying that this transmission must take place and it's necessary. So we must die to, in order to receive a spiritual reward. Now, why do we have such varied experiences in our lives? You know, when I, when I, I think about all the brethren in the room and all of those that are on Zoom and my brethren in a, in a wider sphere, why do we have such varied experiences? In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, the Apostle Paul gives us some insight. This according to the New Living Translation. He could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. And so Christ became flesh and sacrificed himself. And therefore, he could become a faithful high priest, and he could take away the sins of the people. Continuing, since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Wow, that's a powerful scripture, isn't it? Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. And conversely, his footstep followers that are more than overcomers are also receiving suffering and testing for the purpose of being able to help others when they are being tested. Why are we tested? Well, in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul gives us some insights. This according to the New International Version. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. 
this was the purpose of the Levitical priesthood, so that they could represent the people and matters to God and to offer gifts and sacrifice for sin. Continuing, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. And I'm going to stop right there because if you look at Jesus was able to do this to us, but the footstep followers who are more than overcomers will also do this with regards to the world of mankind. My, they have gone astray, haven't they? And he's able to deal with them gently to correct them and to guide them into paths of righteousness. And the reason is, since he himself is subject to weakness. Now, we don't often think about Jesus as being subject to weakness, but remember, when the woman touched the, the edge of his garment, and some strength went out of him. So, yes, Jesus was in the form of the flesh, and he did feel weakness. And that was part of the human experiences. This is why he has to offer sacrifice for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And so this is the reason that we're being tested. Dying and the dying process helps us to become sympathetic high priests. So die, dying helps us to become sympathetic and also, if rightly exercised, to be gentle and compassionate. And that's part of the rule of those mediators in the kingdom. You know, when we think about the seasons of our lives, we think about Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Such a powerful chapter and a, and a beautiful chapter that, that really lays out the overall uh, times of our lives. We'll read it. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, and a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. You know, when we think about this, this really lays for the many experiences of the times of our lives. It really lays out the highs and the lows in our lives as well. And when we think about Moses, he had times and seasons in his life and roles as well. You know, he started out very modestly, being a Hebrew baby that was rescued in the reeds from really certain death at the time. He went on to become a shepherd in one period of his life. He came back to uh, free the Israelites and lead them into the promised land. And then ultimately, he, he laid down and died. And so these are the different roles for the different periods of Moses' life. The question is, do we willingly accept the roles which we are given in different seasons of our lives? You know, we tend to want to hold on or move to the next role at times in our lives. You know, when we're very young, we always want to be older. I want to be older. I want to be able to do these things. And then we reach that stage in life where we're very vital 
and we have the ability to do many things and to grow and develop and help others. We, we come to the season in our life where we're looked at for wisdom and for knowledge, but not necessarily for physical strength anymore. And then finally, we are at the point in our lives where he must increase, that we can decrease. We lose our vitality and lose many of our faculties. Are we willing to accept the role at the time we are given it by the Lord? So God gives us roles in our lives, and this is an important part of faith as well. Sometimes we step up and sometimes we step down. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 9 through 15, it says, what do workers gain from their toil? What do they gain from their toil? And we realize, you know, that man was put on the earth and it said, you know, when he was cast out of the garden that they would toil by the sweat of their brow and they would have to fight uh, for, for food and, and sustenance and so forth. In Genesis 3, 17 and 18, that curse is laid down. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. And so we see that mankind has sweated and toiled throughout the, this present evil world to, to have enough to eat, to be able to provide for their families. And so it's a, a daily toil. Now, of course, in our modern day and age, this is not so much by the sweat of the brow as it has been in the past, but we realize we still have to struggle to survive and to eat. And this is evident more so in many of our brethren from other countries that, um, you know, where they truly don't know where their next meal is going to come from. We in the United States, we deal with our abundance and we try to help those who might not be as fortunate as we. But in many parts of the world, many people do not un understand where their next meal will come from. And so they're especially toiling every single day. And they're also affected more by droughts and so forth because of their lack of resources as well. In Ecclesiastes 3.10, it says, I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. So it's not only toiling for their food, but the, the degradation that comes through Adamic sin, the sickness, the disease, the aging, and the death that has been laid upon the human race. You know, we thank God because we realize this is but for a moment in the grander scale. In Genesis 3.19, he, he really gives the death sentence. For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And we realize how this plays out in, in humanity. You know, we're made up of a few pounds of, of minerals and chemicals and quite a bit of water. And ultimately, when we go in the grave, we return to the dust of the ground. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, we have... Just a beautiful statement. He has made everything beautiful in its time. And, you know, just like this picture, as we age, we, we look back and we see the young, vital person that we were in our prime. But God has allowed this. This is part of that penalty of death. He's allowed this thing to have seasons. In 1 Peter 1.24, we read, For all flesh is as grass, the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. And so in God's infinite wisdom, he has really set this principle forth. That there's a time to reap and there's a time to sow. And there's a time of beauty and a time of fading away. I just love this picture because in every old person, there is a young person. My grandma mother used to tell me prior to her death that she, there was a 29-year-old girl inside of her, and she still felt that way. 
And that's kind of personified by Ecclesiastes 3.11. And we're going to read it according to New International because I just love the way that they put it. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. So the, despite the fact that the world is caught in this seemingly endless cycle of sin, dying, and death, God has set eternity in their hearts. And we see this in religion and philosophy. Somehow mankind realizes that life should go on, that we shouldn't go and die and go into the grave. And yet that's what's happened. And so we find the fulfillment of this scripture that, that no one, well, I'll give you the exception, of course, is but those that are spirit begotten can see what God has done from the beginning to the end the value of this time in which we live. In Ecclesiastes 3.15, we read, whatever is has already been, and what will, and what will be has, all, has been before, and God will call the past to account. He's really saying here that things seem to, there's nothing new under the sun, right? And that's what we have in Ecclesiastes 1.9. There is nothing new under the sun. There are experiences. And while the details of the experiences may vary, the results and the circumstances and the experiences are the same of sin, sickness, and death. And so we share experiences common to mankind. And that's a vital part of our role and the experiences that we're having at this time. You know, it said, we often aren't responsible for what happens to us, but we are responsible in how we react to it. And I would tell all the young people and, that are listening, this is a very important principle in life. So we're not responsible for what happens to us. Another way of saying this is life is only 10%. 10% what happens to us and 90% on how we respond or react to it. So we have choices to make. And these experiences, remember, are experiences that are common to men. So how do we respond to the dying process? That's the question. How do we, what's our response to the things that are happening to every other person in the human race? Is it traumatic? Well, certainly disease and these things are traumatic, but is that what overwhelms us? Is that how we respond? Is it painful? Well, certainly these experiences are painful. Sin, sickness, and death is a painful thing. Jesus wept. Or do we say, why me? Why do I have to go through this experience? I don't think I should have to. And why me is almost saying to God, I don't trust your judgment. Or do we look at it as precious? This is really the key here. How do we respond to the experiences? God says our dying experiences are precious. Is that how we view them as well? Well, if not, we should adjust our mind and look at it that way. What are we to learn? And what are the what is the example we are to be to others as well? I've got some questions. Have you experienced the loss of a child? Are you involved with someone who faces chronic medical problems? Have you had surgery to correct some serious medical conditions? Does it seem you spend all of your time going to the doctor? Do you wonder if you're ever going to feel good again? Are you facing health problems that keep you from the Lord's service? Well, the Lord tells us, for our light of fiction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more and exceeding eternal weight of glory. And the Lord just might be saying to us, Dear child of mine, you knew when you gave your life to me 
that you would not be insulated from the ravages of disease. Even Jesus was surrounded by those whose health was compromised. And remember how he lovingly tended to their needs and at times healed them. In doing so, he was illustrating the healing work of the kingdom. But also he was learning the lesson of the consequences of Adam's sin through these experiences. You too are privileged to have such circumstances to develop and mold your character. And while you navigate this illness, your love, patience, and faith is being developed in a way that no other experience could produce. Are these trials wearing you down? Then lean on me. Are these experiences more than you can bear? Then come to me in prayer. Do you feel all alone and uncertain about this experience? Then lay hold of the promise, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Do we have mental challenges? Do you suffer from chronic depression or severe mood swings? Are you anxious around crowds? And do you feel uncomfortable in public? Are you unable to maintain your focus to get things done? Does worry and guilt overwhelm your life? Are you driven by impulses that seem beyond your power? Is your life filled with stress and anxiety? Well, we're told that God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so as we face mental challenges, the Lord may just be saying to us, Dear child of mine, I understand your mental struggles. When I first touched you, it was not for the abilities of your mind, but for your qualities of heart. And although I needed you to have a mind capable of learning and embracing the truth, I was never interested in the power of your intellect. You realize that both smart and simple, healthy and sick, are selected and called because of their hearts. So do not doubt if I am dealing with you. When I called you, I knew the experiences you would go through in life. Your current challenges are necessary in molding you into becoming a sympathetic high priest. For many in the kingdom will need the healing balm that you are developing through your trials. So if your mind is limiting your service to me, don't despair. And remember that I have promised you, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. Another issue that we all run into as we age is decreases in our strength and vitality. Have you lost much of your youthful strength and energy? Is your eyesight or hearing fading away with time? Are you unable to lose weight? Have you lost control of some of your body functions? Are you in therapy for chronic conditions? Have you had surgery to replace worn out body parts? God gives us a promise. God is my strength and power, and he maketh my way perfect. And so if we see these issues in our life, the Lord may be saying to us, Dear child of mine, I know that you have always used your health and vitality in service to me. But now you find your strength and energy diminishing. Do not be surprised at this. It is a crucial part of your learning the lesson of humility and submission to my will. Only in leaning on me in your weakness can you prove your faithfulness beyond the shadow of a doubt. And if you are rightly exercised in these difficult experiences, it will amplify your trust in me throughout all eternity. Remember that if proved faithful, you will be entrusted with the divine nature. Then, in the ages to come, when you have infinite power, you will delight to do my will throughout all eternity. So call upon me to give you strength in every time of need. And remember my promise that my grace is sufficient for thee, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
you know, all of us go through the aging process and we're in different uh, positions on this continuum of age. But we have some questions. Is the beauty you once possessed fading away? Are you developing wrinkles and is your skin getting thin? Is your hair turning gray or falling out? Are you not able to sleep or wake up refreshed? Does your body seem to be slowly falling apart? Are you getting frail? The Lord promises us, the Lord seeth not as a man seeth, for the man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And so if you're experiencing this, the Lord may be saying to you, Dear child of mine, I know that in your youth you were willing and able to serve with energy and zeal, but now you are in a different chapter of your life. You are now a mentor, a role model, and a leader for those much younger than you. They look to you for guidance and assurance. As you age, your inner beauty, stability, and true character shine through for all to see. You are going through the aging process, an experience which is especially difficult. Only through experiencing these things firsthand will you be able to better minister to those in the kingdom. So take note and respond to those around you with spiritual eyesight. And remember that no matter how distressing these changes are to the flesh, I have promised you that though your flesh and your heart faileth, I am the strength of your heart and your portion forever. Dear brethren, over time, our intellect tends to decline. Are you overwhelmed with the cares of this life? Is the world around you changing far too fast? Are you getting increasingly forgetful? Are the situations you encounter getting so complex that you're no longer able to understand or master them? Are you troubled with the problems in your life that seemingly have no solutions? Do all of these things have you tired and uncertain? Beloved, think it not strange, the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. So as we see these changes in our intellect, the Lord may be saying, Dear child of mine, I know that it is difficult to face the diminishing of your mind. As you see these things happening, do not be troubled. Oh, in your youth you were clever and resourceful, and you learned to develop your mental prowess to solve difficult problems. But you also knew that a time would come when these things would become more and more of a problem. I have not left you alone, but I have provided others around you that if you allow them to, will help you navigate the issues of life. But they can only do this if you allow them to. So this is a test of your humble submission to my will rather than insisting on doing everything your own way. Remember that these trials are common to men as they age, so submit to this experience and rest assured in the fact that I am the one that you should come to for help and comfort. For I have provided the promise that our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. Do you find that your mobility is declining? Are you having difficulty in getting around? Is your footing uncertain? Do you need a cane, a walker, or a wheelchair? Have you fallen recently? Do you lack the energy to climb stairs or to go places where you formerly went? Is travel getting more difficult or even impossible? We have a promise, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And so if you find your mobility is declining, the Lord may be saying to you, 
Dear child of mine, I understand your distress in seeing your mobility diminish. You have always used whatever was in your hand in service to others. But you are now facing a chapter in life when this is no longer possible. Yes, more than ever, you must truly lean on me. While you may think in your mind that you could better serve me if only this trial was lifted, remember that this experience is critical in your growth and development. Keep in mind that this season of your life is also important for the development of those around you. They are developing their faith and love by being of service to you. So be gentle with them and let them help you along the way. Be gracious with them in accepting their service for you. In doing so, you will be helping to cultivate their character development and their service to me. And when you grow discouraged, rest assured in my promise to you that I will be the strength of your heart and your portion forever. Are you approaching the end of life? Are you lonely? Have many of your friends died? Are you not able to do the things that you've always made your life meaningful? Is your health and independence slipping away? Do you have to have little to look forward in this life? Are you facing an illness from which you will not recover? Do not question why God, do you question why God hasn't just let you die? We're told in 1 Timothy 4.12, Be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. And so if you are facing these issues, the Lord may be saying to you, Dear child of mine, I fully understand your distress in seeing your flesh fail. You know in your heart that nothing in your life happens by chance. Throughout your life, you have been faithful in many things. Now is the time to prove your faith through patient endurance. Your life has been a model of service and love. You have always depended on the arm of your strength and your mind to resolve issues. But now it is time to take the leap of faith and rest fully in me. You should especially take confidence in the power of prayer. For in asking in prayer, you will find that my strength is mightier than any strength that you ever possessed, and that my wisdom exceeds any intellect that you ever had. In your weakness, you will demonstrate a power that up until now you could only imagine. Remember that your attitude, outlook, and demeanor will be a model for others to demonstrate what true faith is, and your faithfulness will be an example of the believers. You assume that this experience was all about you, but now is the time for those around you to step in and take charge. Only through them practicing true religion, ministering unto the sick and the widows, can they demonstrate their commitment to truth and righteousness. Your current situation is a stepping stone for others to make their calling and election sure. And remember that your trial will only be for a bit longer, and take consolation in my promise. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. You know, in James, the, we're told, God blesses those who are patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those that love him. Looking once again at our theme scripture, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of his, enemy, of his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints is the death of our flesh precious highly valued to us 
the dying process is a precious part of paying our vows, and it really seals our vows. We're reminded of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So the question we have, how do we view individually the death of our flesh? We thank our Heavenly Father, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Amen.